Yeah. Okay, then come on in. Come on in. And there is 
Remember I talked about the green cards back there? And if you're new, sign up on the green card. And now it's time to welcome each other and you can have some greeting time. Talk to someone that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love the year. So, anyway, I still love you. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> All right. Um, anyways, good to see Tim. We're going to take a, uh, a couple minutes and just spend some time in meditative prayer. And I'm going to ask you to just kind of quiet yourself. We will take uh, maybe 30, 40 seconds of just silence and be quiet. I will read for us from Psalm 25. And uh, as I do, I will stop every couple of verses and give us something to think, to ponder, uh, to pray. So let's just take a minute, and if you feel like you need to close your eyes, do that. If you want to look up, do that. Whatever, whatever you need to do to kind of get alone in the crowd, in a sense. says, show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Where do you need God's guidance and direction in your life? What decisions, choices, directions do you need to hear from him? 
take a moment and just hold those up to him. Ask for that, for him to lead you, to show you the right path. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. Take a moment to think of the ways that God has been merciful to you, the forgiveness he has shown you, the consequences from your actions that you didn't have to face. God's mercy. Sit and consider his unfailing love and mercy for you. is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his commands. Where are the areas where you feel like God is calling you to increase humility, increase to faithfulness, increase to obedience? Take a minute and just talk to God about it. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive our many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord and he will show them the path they should choose? Would you guys stand? We will read together Psalm 25, 4 through 12. We will sing and Dustin will come and lead us in our discussion. You covered me with 
whole semester just played play quiet like Dave Matthews Van Riffs the whole time even while the professor was talking. So I just started to have this deep seated hatred for <laughs> So much so that like when we would be in the, you know, the, in the, we called it saga, it was like the eating area. Um, I would tell my friends about him, we would make fun of him. So the next year, somehow I bumped into him and started to get to know him. And eventually I became really good friends with him and I was like his best man at his wedding. So he always like jokes about how I hated, hated him. <laughs> Well deserved, yeah. I've got to play some big nappy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> So there, there's a toll in Jericho, and Zacchaeus, it says here, was the head of all of these uh, toll collectors. He's kind of the, the regional manager, the, the Michael Scott of the ancient world. He was short, he was not very well liked, uh, etc. And we also know that he was very wealthy, and somehow he made a very good living off of managing other toll collectors. And let's remember what Jesus has just said about wealthy people in the passage before this. In his encounter with a wealthy religious leader, he says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus has just said this. And so, on the surface, this wealthy tax collector doesn't seem to be a very good candidate for the kingdom. It's hard to be very optimistic about the, the outcome of this whole thing. But at the same time, we also know this about Jesus. In chapter 15, Luke tells us tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. And so Jesus told a few stories. Right? In one of those stories, he says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? 
Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness to go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will carry it joyfully home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. And in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others. So he, he tells this story, and then he tells the story of the lost coin and, and the prodigal son. And we've been, we've been talking these past several weeks of these different scenarios that Jesus uses to teach of who can receive the kingdom and who cannot. And given what we know so far from the Gospel of Luke, we would have to assume that those who are in power and those who are wealthy are out. We've seen that with the rich young ruler recently. And the sinner and the tax collector are in. They make good candidates. But what happens when someone is all of those things? Like Zacchaeus. He's in power. He's wealthy. And yet he's also a tax collector. And because of that, he's despised as a sinner. And so it kind of gets tricky. Like how will Jesus respond to this guy? It was all of these things he's been talking about wrapped up in one. The story goes on. Zacchaeus tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. Man, it's so hard to just read that and not sing it. It's like, this all through my head, Zacchaeus was a little man. It, man, it's just it's constantly up there. It's kind of like, it reminds me of, of Bob right now behind that science soundboard. <laughs> He's back in the summer. You need a school or something. There it is. Um, let me ask, let me ask, please nobody email about that. Bob and I are good friends. He, he's the one that told that joke earlier. But we're on good terms, so please don't email about that. Um, why did Zacchaeus climb up in a tree? Okay, so he says because he was a little man. And as far as I know, as far as I know, there are a lot of shorter people that go to the parades and can see just fine. So something else seems to be going on here. There seems to be something deeper in this story than just Zacchaeus was too short to see amongst the crowd. Because the, the problem is, not only was he too short, but apparently no one would let him to the front to see. People were kind of like keeping him to the back. They are boxing them out a little bit. And as someone who was, was hated in society, it's, it's doubtful that anyone was looking for a chance to accommodate him so he could see Jesus pass by. In fact, the text actually says he was too short to see on account of the crowd. And that phrase has a causative force to it. It's not simply that Zacchaeus can't see over the crowd because he's too short, but in fact, the crowd will not let him see. They present themselves as this obstacle between him and Jesus. They refuse him the privilege because they think he's a lowlife. And like the blind beggar from, from last week, Zacchaeus goes to extraordinary lengths to fulfill his quest, even enduring the probable shame of climbing a tree as an adult male who had a position in the community as hated as he was, as a wealthy manager. You know, you're doing kiddish things. There's no honor in that in this society. You're climbing a tree? What are you, what are you 10 years old? It's embarrassing. It would have just added fuel to the crowd's fire. This guy's pathetic. Look at him climbing a tree. But the links that he goes to illustrates his incredible eagerness to see Jesus. He's obviously heard about it. The parallels between rich Zacchaeus and the poor blind beggar are striking. Their bank accounts may have been totally different, but they were both marginalized by society, particularly by the religious community. 
They were both seen as outside of the bounds of God's grace. And despite his wealth, he had the same low status as the widow, as the other tax collector, as the children, as the blind man. But they have something else in common as well. They were, they were both persistent in seeking out Jesus. They both had to overcome obstacles to try to get to him. And this is what happens, verse 5. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, again, it's hard not to, to read, to sing this. Come down, I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. It says they grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Let me ask just about this part of the story. What is it that stands out to you? What strikes you as odd? What observations do you make about this, this encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus? That he calls him by name? Did they, I don't know if they knew each other before that. Yeah, that he calls him by name? How does Jesus know this guy's name? Out of all the people that were around, this would be the last guy that Jesus would have known. That, that is very strange. It seems to be something only a prophet could do. And he only wanted to see Jesus? He didn't necessarily want to meet Jesus? Yeah, yeah, it just says he, he wanted to see him. He wanted, so he obviously had heard about him, knew about him, just wanted to, yeah, get a good look at Jesus. Yeah, that's another weird thing. In no time in, in this in this culture would you ever invite yourself over to someone's house. That's that's absurd, especially a guy like Zacchaeus. And and further, no pious and respectable Jewish person would ever eat in the house or eat a tax collector's food. So it's, it's really the strange scene. He calls out to Zacchaeus by his name somehow. And then invites himself over to his house and is totally willing to, to enter his home of this notorious sinner and, and have a meal with them. Very strange. And so you have to ask, well, what is Jesus doing here? And I think Lana's right. I think he's lifting up someone that the religious community and society at large has shoved down. He calls out to Zacchaeus by name, giving him honor that he is personally known by Jesus. He's valuable enough as a human being to have his name spoken. There's something powerful about that. The, the people thought he was worthless, and then they hear Jesus with, with such knowledge that he's, he's worthy to be called out to. How shocked the people would have been. And Jesus says, I must eat at your house today. This is word we've seen several times in Luke. It's a very strong word. That means it is by divine necessity that I come to your house and eat. It is God's will that I come and dine with you today. He's begun this process of, and Jesus does this a lot through the Gospel of Luke, this process of making an outsider an insider. Remember at the beginning of, of Luke, the prophecy that Jesus would exalt the humble and humble the exalted. I mean, it's basically scenario after scenario through the Gospel of Luke and what you see Jesus doing. Zacchaeus responds to all this with incredible joy. He's genuinely receptive of Jesus' weird invitation to eat at his house. But as Zacchaeus responds with joy, the crowds respond with grumbling. Even, you know, it's like, Jesus, you may call him by his name, but we know him as a notorious sinner. Jesus' mission continues to run counter to expectations. And the story ends like this. 
Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. <coughs> the big question here is, is, what is actually happening with this conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus here? I've heard, and maybe you've heard this as well, I've heard many people say that Zacchaeus, as he is now in front of, of the Lord, he's, he's overwhelmed with this, this horribly sinful life he's lived, and you know, in experiencing this incredible grace, he's repenting of a lifetime of sin, of cheating people, of being a bad tax, tax collector. He's repenting, and now Jesus is offering him salvation in account of this repentance. This is a, a very standard evangelical way to read this passage. And then this may surprise you, may not, but I'm going to suggest that that isn't anything of what's happening here. It's unfortunate because the translation here is, is kind of bad. It, it says, it makes it sound like it's the future. The NLT says, it has Zacchaeus saying, I will give half my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I will give them back four times as much. It reads as if it's in the future tense. As a response to Jesus coming to his house. But the problem is there is no future tense here. This is all present. <coughs> And if you're, if you're nerdy, it's a present progressive. And what the text literally says is, Jesus, I give half my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheat, or if I do cheat someone, if I overtax them, my practice is to give them back four times as much. He's not telling Jesus what he is going to do now as a response of this encounter with him. He's simply relaying to Jesus what his practice has been. He's saying, my current practice, Jesus, is to give half my wealth to the poor. What do you think of that? Luke's narrative says nothing of Zacchaeus' need for repentance, nor does Jesus ask him to repent of anything. Because the truth is, not all tax collectors were dishonest. Not all tax collectors were cheats. It's not a story of conversion. Zacchaeus doesn't resolve to undertake any new practices. Zacchaeus simply presents for Jesus' evaluation his current behaviors regarding money. Isn't that interesting? What's surprising is that Zacchaeus hits on money stuff first. That's strange. Like, if you have an encounter with Jesus, and you're trying to kind of evaluate how you're doing with living in this kingdom thing, that wouldn't be the first thing that came to mind. Well, here's my budget, Jesus. Here's kind of, you can see here, like, this is my giving section, so, you know, what do you think? Zacchaeus doesn't re refer to his behaviors or commitments in regard to prayer or fasting or tithing or even in a decision to enter a different line of work. I mean, those are kind of some of the things I would say. I was like, well, Jesus, I'm a pastor. Isn't that cool? Like, I give this much away. Is this kind of what my prayer life looks like? I'm not sure Jesus was interested in many of those things. But he actually responds in a way that makes you realize that Zacchaeus has some kind of inside knowledge of the teachings of John the Baptist and Jesus himself regarding economic justice, giving to the poor, looking out for the vulnerable. Think back to Luke 3, when John the Baptist teaches what your response, how what repentance looks like in regard to the availability of the kingdom. Remember the crowds asked, well, with this inbreaking of the kingdom, what should we do then? And John replies, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? And he replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. It's 
amazing because Zacchaeus confesses to Jesus that he has been living as one who has accepted the invitation into God's kingdom. Somehow Zacchaeus has heard this teaching and responded to it. He's not repenting right now because he already repented a long time ago. And has been currently living with the values of the kingdom in his life. And that's why he's so excited to see Jesus. That's why he's filled with joy and excitement rather than fear and anxiety. Because he's been following Jesus this whole time. And so Jesus proclaims as a result of this faith that he sees being worked out in Zacchaeus' life and his practices, his salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown, he has proved by the way he lives, by the way he spends his money, by the way he takes care of the vulnerable, that he is one of Abraham's sons. And so what happened isn't conversion or salvation as much as it is divine vindication. The religious community may see Zacchaeus as an outsider, but he's not an outsider at all. John the Baptist said in Luke 3, 8, he says, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, well, we're safe, we're descendants of Abraham. And Zacchaeus has proved that he is a son of Abraham by the way he lives. And so Jesus rightly vindicates him and restores him to the community of God's people. Jesus lifts Zacchaeus up before the religious leaders, before the townspeople, and defends his own coming to Zacchaeus' house in the first place. Notice, before Jesus pronounces salvation on his household, notice he never asks, Zacchaeus, have you guys invited me into your heart? Have you, have you done that? We can do that right now. Have you said the sinner's prayer yet? Have you, have you guys thought about that? You know, it's weird because those things in the Gospel of Luke are always strangely absent when Jesus goes around throwing out salvation here and there. Jesus almost exclusively gauges if someone has entered and embraced the kingdom of God or not based on how they use their money and possessions and how they treat the most vulnerable in society. Seriously, I mean, read through the Gospel of Luke again. It's almost exclusively of how people use their money and possessions and how they treat the most vulnerable in society. Those are the two things that prove whether we are real children of God or not. But for some reason, that, that got lost in a, a lot of our churches along the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, if someone asks you, well, are you living in the kingdom? Are you living with kingdom values? We, we would start with our, our budgets and our finances and our generosity. Or, or the things that we do to show concern for those who are marginalized or vulnerable. But again, those are the two things that Jesus comes back to again and again and again. And I don't think he'd be looking for much different things today. The evidence of one who has entered and lives under God's rule and reign is someone who is not possessed by their possessions, but uses what they have to include, to lift up society's vulnerable and oppressed. There's no exceptions to that. I don't think it's too much to say that if our life is not characterized by that in some way, we're probably not living in the kingdom. We're not living under the rule and reign of God. Tina will talk more about this next week with the parable that Jesus tells right after this because it really ties in and probably should have been teached together, but we're going to learn. Jesus makes this allusion, though, at the end to Ezekiel 34, which I'm sure is a passage you all know and understand. Um, but it begins by criticizing the shepherds of Israel, the religious leaders who feed themselves but let others starve. Ezekiel says, you have not gone out looking for the, those who have wandered away and are lost. 
Instead, you have ruled them with harshness and cruelty. And isn't that exactly the way the religious leaders have treated Zacchaeus and those like him? You have not gone out looking for them. You have excluded them. You have pushed them behind a barrier in a parade. You won't even let this guy come forward to see Jesus. But here's God's response to this. His promise from Ezekiel 34. It says, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for a scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them. I will bring them back home. I will tend my sheep. I will search for my lost ones who strayed away. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. I will feed them. Yes, I will feed them with justice. You know, it's fascinating as you read this story. Because in verse 3 it says that Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus. But in verse 10 you kind of find out, no, it's actually Jesus is seeking those who are lost. And you read the story and you go, well, who's really seeking whom here? Because Jesus came to seek out those who were mistreated at the, hand, the hands of Israel's leaders and shepherd them, seeking hospitality with those who are society's outcasts. Jesus is simply fulfilling the divine will in Ezekiel 34. He is the good shepherd. God himself come to vindicate and restore those who have been ostracized. Who would have thought that a tax collector Someone everyone in society assumed was a notorious sinner would actually be living as a faithful Jewish person. Would actually be declared righteous by Jesus. They misjudged him because their criteria for judging was all messed up. They were looking for markers of faithfulness like prayer and fasting and tithing when Jesus was looking for fairness and justice and generosity. A couple of questions for us to consider today in light of what we learned about Jesus' mission. First, who is it? What kinds of people do we tend to misread, to misjudge? Who may be living faithfully with the values of the kingdom, including fairness and justice and generosity, that we simply miss because our criteria for judging is off base? Or, or those that don't, that don't look like us or, or practice this thing of Christianity exactly the way that we do. We're skeptical. You know, I think probably the closest parallel for me, I was thinking about it this week, the closest parallel to me in society of a tax collector and who we've all agreed to kind of dislike are probably politicians. I am really cynical and skeptical of anything a politician says, of anything they do. You know, when a politician says, you know, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm always like, yeah, right, you can't be a politician and a Christian. That's impossible. And I'm like, yeah, that's a pretty good parallel with the tax collector in, in this, this society. I also tend to assume that if you're wealthy, you're probably stingy. You probably don't take care of the poor. I, I've, got, I've got issues of my own bias toward wealthy people. Even though I guess I'm among them in today's world. But a story like this, it, it comes and shatters these misconceptions because of what Jesus said, what is impossible for man is possible for God. And God tends to seek out those that we would never assume could possibly be faithful followers. He still continues to do that today. And second, the other question that I've pondered this week is, if Jesus is the good shepherd who's seeking out the lost and vulnerable to welcome them in, what does that mean for us, church? Scripture tells us that we are the hands and feet of Jesus in our world. And I wonder, do we have the same impulse, the same drive to seek out the lost? To seek out those that society rejects and embrace them and show them love and accept them? 
those who are ostracized, those who are vulnerable? Do we have room for people that don't look like us in here? People we don't really understand. Those are just a couple of questions to consider. I want to, to, to end today by inviting you to communion. And I want, to, I want to do that on the simple basis that the only reason we are here is that Jesus, the Good Shepherd, sought us out. We're here not because we're on a quest to seek God. It's because God has been on a quest seeking us. He has brought us home. He has bandaged us up. He has nursed us to health. He has invited us into his family. And the table of communion represents the length that Jesus has gone to as the good shepherd to bring us home. <coughs> His body broken for you, and His blood shed for you, so that we would stray no more, so that we would be found at home, included, welcomed, accepted with Him and His family. So I invite you to come and receive. Let's pray together. <laughs> Father, thank you for loving us in such a way that you went to incredible lengths to win our hearts, to invite us into your family, to bring all of us who are on the outside in. God, in response to that today, may we be on the same quest as you are. May we partner together To bring those ones who feel ostracized in the religious community closer in. God, help us to embrace and to seek out those whose society casts out as hopeless cases. Thank you, Father, for what we're about to participate in in communion. For your body broken for us and your blood shed for us. We come and we take it rejoicing and celebrating at your great love. Amen.
and all the week with nothing left. We know that you are holy. We know that you are holy. When all will see.
So go outside and praise the God who met the stars out in the sky. And gather round with those who love and see. For He is our King, and He is our King. We go outside. Praise the God who met the stars out in the sky. Gather round with those who love and sing. For He is our King, and He is our King. And no one should be left out.
on that, we are in this room, uh, February 11th, 7 p.m. at the Canadian's Chapel Pub. Um, Amy talked to you about prayer this morning already, so it's on here as a little reminder. Um, next time will be February 15th. And then mark your calendars for Ash Wednesday, the start of our Lenten season. Eight, February 18th, 6.30, we'll be over at Warner, Warner Pacific. So please um, RSVP if you need um, child care. That would be really important so we can have that arranged. And um, I also want to make an announcement. Oh, and if you haven't got your giving statements yet, then talk to Kelly. So those should be out um, for the lovely tax season as we talked about tax collectors today. Um, <laughs> nice little coincidence. Um, also, I want to share a little bit about what I've been up to behind uh, in the back scenes. Some of you guys may have noticed my post on the table. If it's not, if not, it's there. Um, one thing I have learned as uh, I'm a mental health therapist and I work a lot with couples and I look, work a lot with individuals. And I was reflecting over the years of me doing this, I cannot think of very many sessions that I've had with clients that some form of relationship issue has not come up. Whether it's an individual or a couple or a family or challenges with friends or coworkers or children or parents. And um, in that, I always feel very limited in the role that I have as a therapist because I don't get to be in these people's lives on a daily basis. I don't get to go to their house and have coffee or tea and um, just cry with people, and love with people, laugh with people. Um, and I find that that's something that's really uh, a miss in our culture and our society. So I um, banded together with a few other couples here at Evergreen. Um, and just really to come alongside and preemptively say, we want to be here for you. Um, so we've been meeting over the last six, four months, um, every couple weeks, and just talking about sharing our story and with each other, and also talking about ways that we can be of service and how what can be helpful for families. And so um, the Blacks, the Crestas, the Congdens, the Stewarts, and for the most part, the Castiles, they have a little bit challenging schedule, but we know and love them, so I'm going to include them too, as well as myself, and, and Tom and I have run a few groups in the past, have um, kind of committed to say, hey, we're here for you. We're here for you as um, families, as couples, as individuals, to, um, to minister to, to do life together, and to um, just be a part of your daily life. Um, and in the hard times and also in the good times. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in being part of maybe a group, um, to jump on the table and comment on that thread and let us know, because I would love to gather a group of people together with a very specific focus of helping um, families and individuals be stronger in their relationships with each other and with their kids and with neighbors and with friends and significant others. And so if that's something that is you feel a need in your life or a desire to be part of, let us know. Um, also, to have, we've all preemptively said, yes, we're here for you. So if you need um, and want that kind of one-on-one of -on -one time with another family who's maybe a few seasons ahead of you, then tap our shoulders. Let us know. We're here to help and we're here with you. And it was a really fun, what I really appreciated about hanging out with these um, individuals and couples was the richness of their stories. And it hasn't been easy for all of us. You know, we all have our ups and downs throughout the years and throughout our relationships and throughout our blending our families together and, and raising children. And, and, and their honesty and their transparency was very, um, very much a blessing. And it was very much the part that I don't get to do in my professional world that I love to do in my personal world. So I encourage you guys to tap into to those wonderful resources and others within this room that aren't on that list. You know, we're, it's not limited to that. We just have been preemptively said, yes, we're here for you guys. So I wanted to let you know a little bit about what's been going on there. Um, so will everybody please stand and I will bless us and welcome Lord, we thank you for the gift of in your power, shatter our misperceptions of others. And with your grace and mercy, grow in us fairness, justice, and equity, so that we can see in others what you do. Go in peace.